Chris coming to you live from the library on behalf of Cinefellas, the only website for all your cinephilic needs. Alright, so today I'm going to be counting down my top 10 favorite movies featuring Groundlings Theater alumni. What? You don't know the Groundlings? That's okay. Let me tell you a little bit about their history. So, Gary Alston, who was a former member of the legendary improvisation comedy troupe from San Francisco called The Committee, formed the Groundlings in 1974 with about 50 company members. They performed all around Los Angeles at different venues until they finally settled at 7307 Melrose Avenue in West Hollywood. A school teaching the Groundlings unique brand of short-form improv, singing, acting, and writing opened in 1978. Since then, the Groundlings have given us some of the most well-known comedic talent on stage, on television, uh, and in movies. Um, they've also had some of the greatest writers, such as Jim Rash. Now, you might recognize Jim from his role on the show Community, but did you know that Jim also won an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for the film The Descendants? It's true. The theater is still open. I highly recommend taking classes there. You will not regret it if you're a fan of improv or just comedy in general. With all that talent, I bet you're wondering how I could possibly come up with a criteria for this list. Well, it wasn't easy, but let me tell you how I did it. Okay, so the movies that made this countdown include some of the most memorable performances by former Groundlings from the 1980s up to the present. That means starring roles and some minor roles that, you know, were a little unexpected. I, we'll see what I mean later. But uh, I really do believe that these are examples that had a great influence on comedic filmmaking and also popular culture in general. Whew. All right, now that we got all those formalities out of the way, we can finally get started. Jen? Number 10, Jennifer Coolidge as Stifler's mom in the original American Pie. So Jennifer performed with the Groundlings for about nine years, but for a generation of kids, especially young boys like myself, she'll always be remembered as our first MILF. Uh, the American Pie movies introduced us to a new awareness about sex. Uh, it was our education for a lot of us. Um, whether you identified with the geeky character that just lusted for the unattainable foreign exchange student, um, whether you were the monogamous, monogamous, that's a hard word to say, monogamous type that got your heart broken, or whether you simply just had a very unhealthy sexual appetite for pastry, I'm talking to you, Steve. The original 1999 movie had something for you. But Stifler's mom was the ultimate fantasy. She was a successful older woman with a taste for hyper-mature teens. Jennifer Coolidge only appeared on screen for a few moments, but when she did, she accepted Paul Finch into her bed, and it was a small victory for every high school boy with a raging heart on in the United States of America. She gave birth to the term MILF and also what became known as the Cougar, two staples of American slang. Sorry, Mrs. Robinson, the terms didn't really exist when you were around. Number nine. So, Cassandra Peterson in Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Cassandra came out of the Groundlings with the character Elvira, an over-sexualized female vampire with a Southern California Valley Girl accent, combined with a very satirical edge. In 2016, we accept comedy horror as a really legitimate film subgenre, but that approach was still pretty fresh in the early 1980s. By 1988, Peterson starred in her first feature film as Elvira, bringing the campy, over-the-top humor and sexuality of the character to a national audience. She had a few roles hosting TV shows before that, but the movie really took her to another level. She became a cult phenomenon, uh, helping to create goth culture and giving corpses everywhere a reason to stiffen up. If you know what I mean. Number 8. 
Phil Hartman as Ted Moulton in Jingle All the Way. Alright, so I usually get shit for this one, but just hear me out. Phil basically saves this movie, which is pretty much just a vehicle for Arnold Schwarzenegger, as he transitioned from the kind of action hero to all-around movie star. Phil pushes Arnold's character with relentless antagonism, demanding a higher performance. But it's hard to hate Ted Moulton because Phil also brings a real human quality to the character and lends sentiment sentimentality to the movie. That's something Arnold and his co-star Sinbad just weren't able to do as well. But then, Phil had a great background to pull from, including his many characters developed on Sa Saturday Night Live and The Simpsons but he got it all started at the Groundlings, where he studied from 1975 to 1986. Phil made such a huge impact on Melrose Avenue that the Groundlings dedicated their main theater to his memory. If you go see a show today, you'll see a plaque right on top of the main door. Number seven, Lorraine Newman in Coneheads. All right, so Lorraine is gonna go down in history for many reasons, rightfully so. But chief among them is her distinction as one of the first cast members of Saturday Night Live. Producer Lorne Michaels saw her perform with the Groundlings and was drawn to her versatility. She appeared on the show from its premiere in 1975 to 1980, the first five seasons. During that first run, everyone's favorite alien suburbanites, the Coneheads, were born. Lorraine portrayed Connie, the teenage daughter filled with angst. When Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin took the parents, Beldar and Premit, to the big screen in 1993, Michelle Burke took over as Connie. The Coneheads were just as relevant at that time, two decades later. They expressed literal feelings of alienation in the 1970s that were, that were bred due to a post-Watergate scandal anxiety compounded with the anxiety over the Vietnam War. And in the 1990s, they expressed feelings of alienation when it came to great changes moving from the older guard of the Reagan-Bush years into the Bill Clinton presidency. Lorraine's maturity and experience helped her take on the character of Larta in the new movie. She played the wife of President of the Coneheads' home planet. It was a small role, but it definitely speaks to Newman's creative genius. She's a great character actor that seamlessly moves from one persona to the next, and she's done countless live-action film, film roles and animated characters since doing Connie and Larta including several voices for 2016's The Secret Life of Pets. Number six. So here we have Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan in A Night at the Roxbury. Two for the price of one. But could you really imagine Doug without Steve Butabi or vice versa? I certainly can. not These are two brothers that are the drum and bass of their own rhythm section. All they care about is dancing and the nightlife. Farrell and Catan met at the Groundlings School and soon found themselves together on SNL. The Roxbury Boys started as a sketch with host Jim Carrey and was spun off into a movie in 1998. At that time, electronic dance music, or EDM, as we would now call it, was just emerging from underground house and techno scenes into the pop mainstream. A Night at the Roxbury exposed new audiences to EDM and helped popularize Hathaway's What is Love. And also, the movie introduced me to a lifelong obsession with Richard Grieco. I might be writing about him in my diary later tonight. I guess we'll see. Number five. This one's probably no surprise. It's Will Ferrell in Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. So here in this movie, we have Paul Rudd, Steve Carell, another groundling and numb Chris Parnell, and a host of other comedic geniuses that help make this movie a hit. Uh, it came out in 2004, but Will Ferrell was definitely the centerpiece that lasted long after that. He gave us quotable moments like, It's so damn hot. Milk was a bad choice. And, I'm very important. I have many leather-bound books, and my apartment smells of rich mahogany. But dare I say, Anchorman is also awesome because of its cultural critique. Will's movies are not necessarily known for that type of insight, but Anchorman gives us a look at sexism in popular media, a problem that we still wrestle with today, even though the film is set in the 1970s. 
I'm not saying that this movie in any way helps us end gender inequality, but it might just help us start a dialogue about how to do so. What do you think? Number four, John Lovitz in A League of Their Own. This one might be a little surprising. Uh, Lovitz plays the rem unremarkable and relatively humor humorless, another hard word to say, Ernie Cappadino, recruiter for a female baseball team in 1943. But Ernie has sinister undertones of the many characters Lovitz created with the Groundlings in the 1980s and then on SNL after. One of those characters is the pathological liar Tommy Flanagan. Go on YouTube, check him out if you haven't seen it. Uh, Cappadino is deceivingly complex and Lovitz plays him that way. His job is to help fill out a baseball team of all women while America's men are off fighting in World War II. It's important to understand that at that time, uh, sports were not just a source of entertainment, but they were also a method of national bonding during this war when no one was really certain how it would end and what the world would be like afterwards. Cappadino represents these changing social realities with his skepticism that a professional women's baseball league could succeed, while at the same time being balanced by this sort of recognition that gender roles and expectations were changing in that era. Number three, Julia Sweeney in It's Pat. Now this is one of the first comedies I ever remember seeing. My uncle showed it to me. Julia started with the Groundlings alongside Phil Hartman and John Lovitz before joining them both on SNL. There she developed the controversial character of Pat. The entire joke behind sketches featuring Pat was that no one knew if Pat was a female or a male. And when Julia brought the character to the big screen in 1994, the movie trailer joked that Pat was a cultural event of apocalyptic significance. Alright, so hyperbole aside, <clears throat> excuse me, hyperbole aside, it was a historical event, as Pat was one of the first androgynous characters that had to carry a movie. The film satirizes Americans' discomfort with people that don't fit neatly into gendered categories. It's a really phenomenal feat when you consider that the U.S. only recently took on issues like tra transgendered bathrooms as part of its national agenda. Number two. Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy, and Maya Rudolph in Bridesmaids. All three of these hilarious comedians came through the Groundlings. Stints on SNL for Kristen and Maya, and a lead role on the TV show Mike and Molly for Melissa helped women get the visibility they so rightly deserved in the comedy world. Bridesmaids proved that women could be just as funny, if not funnier, than their male counterparts. <gasps> Calm down, guys. It's true. Um, and the movie became one of producer Judd Apatow's most successful, and that's saying a lot from the guy who brought you 40-Year-Old Virgin and Knocked Up. Along with brilliant minds like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, Kristen, Melissa, and Maya staged a revolution in contemporary comedy that set the tone for Amy Schumer, arguably the most popular comedic voice today. And of course, Kristen and Melissa also appear in the reboot of Ghostbusters. And number one, drumroll, Paul Rubens in Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Now I have to admit, I'm a little biased here, I love Pee-wee and his weird world. Paul created Pee-wee while at the Groundlings in the late 70s with the help of co-writer Phil Hartman. The character became huge in LA, getting his own show at the famous Roxy Theater. A recording of that show was featured on HBO in 1981, and Pee-wee became a national hit. A few years later, Paul was working with director Tim Burton and composer Danny Elfman on Pee-wee's Big Adventure. That movie was originally conceived as a remake of the Disney classic Pollyanna, but the idea morphed after Warner Brothers gave Paul a bicycle as a gift. He came up with a story that reimagined an Italian neorealist classic called The Bicycle Thief. With another character, Pee-wee's Big Adventure might have just kind of turned into a simple tale of a hero looking for his lost bike. A sort of journey. But Pee-wee's journey is a surrealistic dream of cartoonish characters and a bizarre reality where almost anything goes. The movie won Pee-wee a long-running children's television show that ran for five seasons, and the rest is history. 
Paul went on to many other roles, both as himself and other characters, but he'll always be known as Pee Wee Herman, and rightfully so. Few characters in any medium stand the test of time like Pee Wee. That wraps up our list for this week. Are you ready for the countdown to end? <laughs> I know you are, but what am I? <clears throat> Sorry, I just I, I slipped into some uh, some Pee Wee Herman right there. Whew, dangerous. <clears throat> Alright, anyway, I want to know about your favorite performance by a groundling. Let me know in the comments. I really would love to hear from you. But let's keep it constructive, please. We want to start a dialogue, not a diatribe. Alright everybody, I'm Chris, reminding you to share a movie with someone you love. See you next time.